Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for the thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we add nine, uh, have nine billion souls by 2050 on the planet, we need to look at how we're going to be able to take care of them with all the basic infrastructure. And of course, to make everything work, we certainly need energy. And so we're really a focus on renewables as we go through. And we have a gentleman sitting right beside me who's been involved in this for uh, many years and actually moving Washington, D.C. and the capital region forward as far as increasing the amount of electrical energy that's coming from renewables, specifically in solar. This is uh, Theodore. He goes by the name of Ted E. Trebu, who Jr. He's the managing director of the District of Columbia Sustainable Energy Utility, known better as DCSEU. And Ted, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Thank you for having me, Dr. Hancock. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always good to see you. And I have to, full disclosure, we're working with Ted very closely, a number of projects in Washington, D.C. And I think your organization's doing outstanding work. And Thank you so much. We've been around for just over three years now, and we are very, very excited about the future. Well, you're getting even more excited and you're moving out, but tell us what is the DCSEU and your parent is all the way in Vermont, so how Our, is such a small state <laughs> reaching into DC and then other places around the United States? Sure, our, our parent is Vermont Energy Investment Corporation based in Burlington, Vermont. VEIC is a 27-year-old nonprofit that got into the energy efficiency world a little over a quarter of a century ago. But here in the District of Columbia, we had energy efficiency programs about eight to 10 years ago. Some were run by the electric utility, some were run by the gas utility, some were run by the city itself without much success, without any coordination at all. And the city decided back in 2008 to bring all of the efficiency services under one umbrella and bring in a professional organization to do it. And that's when they went out and found Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. So we run the energy efficiency programs in Vermont, as, as I've explained, in Ohio as well. We operate under the brand of Efficiency Smart out there. We run renewable programs in New Jersey, and we run energy efficiency and renewable programs in the District of Columbia. I think it's just incredible that you're uh, tying together the renewable energy, solar mm -hmm. specifically, but also doing the weatherization, doing the uh, increased uh, insulation, yeah. also the home energy testing. Yeah. How does all this fit together as a package and why should homeowners and even commercial projects really know about this and what should they know about bringing all these services together? Oftentimes, in the world today, when energy bills are increasing and increasing, energy is something where you can take a hold of. You can gain control over it. Your rent, your mortgage will continue to increase. But you can really get control of your energy bills. And a lot of times, people don't understand how they can take control of their energy bills. Uh, we help them go in and do the diagnostics. We do the audits. And then after we perform an audit, we have at least 10 or 15 different options for either a resident or even more options on the commercial side to help package a program lighting, HVAC systems, heating systems, chillers, motors, fans, particularly lighting and, and even solar so that we can bring all of these things together to optimize energy efficiency in the home, in the small commercial space, and in large commercial spaces as well. Well, I know this is uh, really a move by city council and the mm -hmm. mayor of Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., that they want to be the most green city in the United That's States. It. Many cities competing, mm -hmm. which is Chicago, New York, L.A., and uh, many others. And so it's important that people really know that mm -hmm. you're there and uh, you're reaching out. But I know there's a special component that you have that you don't normally think <laughs> about. It's called uh, social equity. What is social equity? How is it defined? And why does DCSU have that as part of their charter and the mandate actually to be able to operate, to do all these good things in the, in the capital city? Right. Social equity is very important to us. And the way we look at it is that 
the cost of energy is more heavily borne by low-income residents. If you're out there making two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year, and your energy bill goes up by twenty or fifty dollars a month, it doesn't really make a big hit in your household, in your daily lives. If you're making much less money, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars a month is an extremely large amount to have to absorb in terms of an energy bill. We are funded through a public benefits surcharge, so all ratepayers residents and commercial ratepayers and the federal government as well, the federal government is the big cat in the city, um, everyone pays in and therefore everyone is entitled to services from the program and the district wants us to measure the social equity work that we do very, very specifically. The district wanted to make sure that not only were we helping people reduce the amount of energy they were consuming and therefore reduce their electric bills, you know, cut down their carbon footprint, but we also wanted to create jobs for DC residents. We have to create the equivalent of 88 full-time jobs a year that pay living wage, not minimum wage, living wage mm -hmm. for district residents. We have to spend about 35% of our funding with certified business enterprises. Those are actually businesses that are headquartered in paying taxes in the city, giving opportunities to district contractors to do work throughout our programs. And we also spend 30% of our funding by mandate, by law, 30% of our funding is spent in the low-income community. Without our assistance, oftentimes low-income residents would be left out of the energy efficiency projects. They are expensive. There's no sense in denying that. And so we want to make sure that the low-income residents receive actually more uh, value than they're putting in, but we want to make sure that there's equity. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, we have those three facets of our work. Traditionally, when this work is done all around the country, people are just trying to save energy, which is great. We'll never deny that, but we're going beyond that creating jobs, creating opportunities for contractors, and making sure that the low-income community is served at the same time. Looking at the uh, workforce development, why is it so important to DCSEU and the city that you really have this component? And it's not only just putting people to work, but you actually you're providing you know, long-term training and education to people. Yeah. They are actually getting certificates that they can use if they go to other jurisdictions. They can actually take those, that certification with them. Yeah. Why is that so important? It's very important to the city because we have, as, as Dickens said, a, quite frankly, a tale of two cities in some respects. You have part of the city very, very well educated, um, very low unemployment, you know, probably south of 3% unemployment. You have parts of the city where educational, uh, attain, they haven't attained the education that's necessary. Unemployment exceeds 20% in some areas, and so it's important that as we take this money and invest it in programs that we also invest in humans as well. And so what we do through our mandate to create, create 88 green jobs a year is we bring residents in and train them in energy efficiency. I would consider myself to be one of those, quite frankly. The deal that Vermont Energy Investment Corporation had with the city was that they would come in train a cadre of DC residents to work in the energy efficiency mm -hmm. realm and then eventually turn over the whole operation to the DC based crew and so that's what we're working on right now but we're training people not only in solar installation which is very popular but it's more important to put the solar panels in the right place if I put the solar panels on the north side of the house it will be completely ineffective if I put them on a roof that doesn't have the structural integrity to support the systems, the solar panels will be in someone's living room. Again, not producing much power. If I put the solar panels where in an area where we have a lot of trees in DC, where they're shaded and they're blocked by the, the sun is blocked by the trees, again, the solar panels won't work very well. So we're training not only in the installation of the solar panels, but how do you site the solar panels, and then on the back end of it, how do you inspect them to make sure they're operating at peak efficiency and to monitor them over the years. Those are good paying jobs. Mm -hmm. They're jobs uh, where we can train residents fairly quickly, they do take a lot of computers to help us do this work, but the residents are very, very excited about it. Looking at this, Ted, this is very important, all the things you're talking about, but this uh, knowledge and uh, information transfer into mm -hmm. the local communities, how do you see training people who live in the local communities, mm -hmm. they're working in the local communities, mm -hmm. how do you see that spreading information about climate change, about how to reduce your energy uses, and at the same time, the importance of having renewables as the mix as far as energy is concerned? 
The district, like many other jurisdictions, has taken on a mandate or put out a mandate for the utility companies to get a certain percentage of their power from renewable sources. To date, we have installed about 12% of the city's renewable generating capacity, and that's just in two years of doing this work. We're really going to take off now that the snow is off of the roofs and start going back at it again very hard this summer and into the fall to hopefully install about 60 to 80 more systems on low-income homes and on apartment buildings, multifamily buildings as well. But as you know, we live in a transient society here in the District of Columbia. Many people come in and they go out. And so as they leave, they're taking marketable skills with them to wherever in the planet they might be employed next, spreading what we believe is the good word about renewables, how important they are to our planet, and to get us off of the dependency of fossil fuels, which is quite frankly burning our planet up. Mm -hmm. Looking at weatherization, this is one of the things that you know people, you know, they can see the solar panels mm -hmm. going in. But you know, when you start putting insulation in, you start sealing around the windows mm -hmm. and the joints. Mm -hmm. uh, you put in more uh, energy efficient windows and doors. Mm -hmm. A lot of people can't see that. How do you work with weatherization and the home energy testing to make sure you have very tight homes and you're not just putting solar power on a mm -hmm. house that right. all that's just going right out the windows, right, doors, right. and the, floors, and walls. The, the, the solar is the sexy part of it. It's the visible part of it. And the insulation and the air sealing, as you said, is the bricks and mortars of it, quite frankly. We can put a solar system on your house and immediately save you 30 to 40 percent on your electricity bill. That's amazing. 30 to 40 percent savings. With about a three kilowatt system, 30 to 40 percent on your, on your energy bill. But then we get into the air sealing. We get into the insulation. We get into the windows, doors, and other areas where you're really leaking additional uh, air so, so we can cut down on the amount of power that you consume even further. Mm -hmm. And so we, we really, and they're, they're different sciences and skills, of course. One is operating completely inside the house, the other exterior to the house. But we believe both of them combined maximize the efficiency for the home and they're very important to marry the two sciences together. Mm -hmm. And make sure that people aren't spending uh, excessive amount of money. Yeah. We only have mm -hmm. about uh, 30 seconds left. Mm -hmm. Where do you see uh, the DCSU going over the next 5, 10, 15 years? What we're doing today can be transported anywhere on the planet. We looked at, we spoke to some people in Tanzania, 85% of the residents don't even have electricity. Taking solar out into the communities, distributed generation, that's the future. That's where we'd love to see this going moving forward. Fantastic. Well, Theodore E. Trebu, Jr., who is the Managing Director, District Columbia, Sustainable Energy Utility, thank you for being with us, and thank you for watching as we create the Emerald Planet. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high-interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent. Like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. We're back 
to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you looking around the globe for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move towards 2050. And by the time we're at 2050, it's estimated we should have about 2 billion new people on the planet. And so how are we going to be able to take care of all these people at the same time to make sure that they have an increased quality of life and not just existing? And so part of all this is not only to develop the renewable energy that's needed, provide the food, the fuel, the fiber, but also to provide the training and the education and the job that's needed to take care of them so they can in turn take care of their families. We have someone here who has a global solutions organization called CTI Global Solutions, Dr. D. Carroll, President and CEO in Washington, D.C. And Dee, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you here. And tell us a little bit of the origin of CTI Global Solutions, what that means, and uh, some of the things that you've been doing over these past years. Okay, well, CTI Global Solutions is a human capital management firm. And we started out 25, almost 26 years ago to support and provide opportunities for residents of the District of Columbia who ordinarily wouldn't get an opportunity, uh, as well as we branched out to many states throughout the nation. And um, we started with admin, clerical, um, engineering, IT, and so, so forth. So it's really a broad uh, brush as far as any kind of employment opportunities. Yes. What is workforce development? We hear this term, it's mm -hmm. used in incessantly, and mm -hmm. but I'm not sure I've ever heard anybody actually really define what workforce development oh. is. <laughs> well, workforce development actually is preparing uh, workers for the workforce. Uh, you want to develop their skills, enhance, uh, you want to work with them to make sure they keep up with the latest and the greatest. Well, looking at the uh, about the re workforce development and renewable energy mm -hmm. weatherization and the uh, home energy testing and all this, you know, there's a certain uh, level of skills that this mm -hmm. takes. Uh, they can use this here anywhere, actually uh, on a global basis. But what kind of basic uh, skills, what kind of basic understanding do people need regardless of what they're going into mm -hmm. for the future and specifically in these areas? Well, first of all, I would suggest that people get an understanding of social responsibility for the environment. That's the first thing. And secondly, they need to hone in on a particular area of interest or concentration that they would like to embark on. Mm -hmm. And once they find that out, then they need to research, find out all the jobs available in that particular area, and hone in on one that they think they can work on. Now, I know that the library system in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. is very expansive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's recognized as being excellent. And many people actually use the library here, you know, you think of libraries, you know, it's old school, it's mm -hmm. going, and actually the libraries are expanding and uh, very important yes. to people. How do the libraries in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding areas in Virginia and Maryland actually help to support this kind of very thing that you're talking about, the research mm -hmm. and being knowledgeable about what's in the industry and new green jobs? Well, I think that in particular, a lot of the low-income residents don't have computers at their homes. So they can rely on the computers in the library as well as other resources to go in there and find out all about you know, the environment, all about green jobs and what's coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the what's called the District of Columbia, the, uh, the uh, solar uh, electric utilities and sustainable uh, energy utilities. And this is something that's really very important because they're really reaching into the communities. They're trying mm -hmm. to provide weatherization to yes. reduce the cost that people have and all that. And I know that you know your company's been around a long time. Mm -hmm. These guys are expanding at a very rapid rate. Mm -hmm. So how do you collaborate with an organization that's very technically uh, oriented mm -hmm. at the same time reaching into the community through a company like CTI Global Solutions? 
solutions? Well, first of all, I would like to just say we're very, very excited to be um, partnering with the DCSEU and also to be a CBE in the District of Columbia. So we partner with entities and organizations to look at what mandates they have. And based on their mandates, we collaborate to make sure that we are in turn providing them with the staffing and taking care of their hiring needs to ensure that they meet their goals. One of the terms that uh, keeps coming up is this notion of social equity and the mm -hmm. importance of it. Washington, D.C. actually has this as a mandate. The D.C. SEU has it mm -hmm. as part even of their charter to operate uh, within the District of Columbia. What is the social equity and then how does CTI Global Solutions help to make sure that an organization like the D.C. SEU mm -hmm. is meeting those mandates but not necessarily just as a mandate, it's mm -hmm. something that they really want to do. It's almost like a social contract with the community, right. provide services, make a profit, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, reach out to the greater community. Reach out and give back. I think it's so important that uh, organizations such as DCSEU give back to the community because the community is, is suffering in many regards uh, in that one, uh, there's a lack of knowledge of the social environment and the responsibility that all uh, residents have a responsibility for. And so the fact that they're going back to reach out to the community, we really embrace that. And any way we can help, you know, we are ready to dig in. Uh, in particular, CTI can get out there and, and do out community outreach as well. Uh, speak to the colleges and, and high schools about uh, green jobs and what's coming down the pike and preparing them. Offer seminars as well for the community residents who may not even realize that this is going on. I think it's really important mm -hmm. on this uh, new green initiative, the green mm -hmm. jobs. I know that Washington, D.C., uh, through the city council, the mayor, and even the agencies within the city are really dedicated to make this a very green city. And that mm -hmm. means, you know, trying to reduce the energy usage and uh, make sure that the water is properly mm -hmm. managed, you know, all these things of natural resources at the same time to have a very beautiful home. So how can people that as they gain these new skills, mm -hmm. you know, for this new green economy, how does that help to expand the understanding within local communities so that people more and more want to embrace this and address the issues of climate change within a very local community mm -hmm. situation? Well, first of all, I think knowledge. You know, you got to have the knowledge of what's going on around you. And surprisingly enough, a lot of us exist day to day not realizing what's going on in our environment and not realizing what responsibility we have to support that. So really ensuring that people have the knowledge of what's going on and, and where they can impact. Well, you know, there's a number of organizations we've talked about, the mm -hmm. DCSEU, and that's a very uh, e expanding uh, organization. Uh, it's, it's very solid. It's well-funded. Uh, they're really uh, training a lot of new people. Mm -hmm. But you have, like, the Catholic Charities and their mm -hmm. uh, green pre-apprenticeship training mm -hmm. program. And then you have the uh, Job Corps, both in D.C. and Northern Virginia. How do you collaborate with, you know, you're expanding the circle. So mm -hmm. how do you constantly reach out and collaborate with these people so that there's a, a common thrust a, a mm -hmm. common goal to all of this, but at the same time, you're meeting mm -hmm. uh, disparate uh, needs within the community. Well, first of all, I think it's very, very important for organizations such as mine to collaborate with these workforce developers. I like to think of them as workforce developers. Um, we can get talent. Uh, from these organizations. Uh, people are going there to get their certifications, to get their training, and it behooves us to be in contact with them because the talent is available. When our clients who are committed to green um, to the green environment and green jobs, when they call us, 
we need to quickly be able to find that talent and place them. So collaborating with the developers or the workforce developers, it's very, very important because it's a win-win. It's a win-win for the uh, workers who have gotten the training as well as my organization who's looking for them. We talked about this a little earlier as far mm -hmm. as using the libraries and going mm -hmm. in doing the research and all that, but there are any three, four, five things that people in the community should be doing to prepare themselves as we move forward the 21st century, this mm -hmm. new green economy, so that they, they're not waiting till the job is there and people are looking for it, mm -hmm. but they're preparing themselves to be able to step in as the opportunities come available. So what are some of the things they should be doing now, not mm -hmm. wait, right. in order they're, so they're ready to pounce if when the opportunities become available? Okay. Well, I would think that uh, again, being conscious of what's going on in the environment first. Secondly, they should uh, research and find out what positions are out there. And as in any job, they have to be committed to the success of what they're working on. Set goals, decide where this fits in you know, your area of concentration or where you would like to be, and go for it, and mm -hmm. go for it. And not only that, you know, I would also suggest that if someone is really interested in moving with this, talk to the workforce developers and see how there may be a fit for you there. Mm -hmm. Looking at, this is going to be a, a quick answer, but mm -hmm. a quick question about uh, GED, high school certificates, mm -hmm. uh, you know, community college. How important is that in today's world as far as allowing people to move forward and take advantage of these new green jobs? Very, very important. Competition is very keen. It's very stiff. And so I would say that's the foundation. Start with that and then you can move on into your area of interest. I know one of the things in working with the FFL, CIO and others, you know, they wanted to, you know, basic eighth grade uh, mm -hmm. education as no, far no. as reading, writing mm -hmm. and uh, math skills. So that's, uh, I'm glad mm -hmm. to hear that you're endorsing that. We only just have about uh, 30 seconds left. Okay. What do you see for the future of uh, CTI Global Solutions over the next 5, 10, 15 years as mm -hmm. you're moving forward with so many mm -hmm. others in this uh, new green uh, jobs area? Well, I see CTI as being the preferred third solution for human capital in the environmental uh, type positions. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to set a green division where we hire green executives and, and move forward. Well, I think it's absolutely fantastic. We have sitting with us uh, Dr. Dee Carroll, President CEO of CTI Global Solutions. Thank you, Dee, for uh, being with us. And thank you for being with us as we look at this notion of green jobs, uh, allowing people to be into the workforce, being prepared as we create the Emerald Planet. I need a job. Necesito trabajo. I would like to speak English better. Me gustaría hablar inglés mejor. I want to be a U.S. citizen. Quisiera ser ciudadano de los Estados Unidos. For over 35 years. Por más de 35 años. The Hispanic Committee of Virginia has been serving our community. El Comité Hispano de Virginia ha estado sirviendo a nuestra comunidad. Job training and placement. Capacitación. Ayuda para conseguir trabajo. Education for children and adults. Educación para niños y adultos. Immigration, naturalization, and medical referrals. Ayuda para los procesos de inmigración y naturalización y orientación sobre médicos are a small part of what we do. son solo una pequeña parte de lo que hacemos. For help, information, or to volunteer, para ayuda, información o para ofrecerse como voluntario, contact the Hispanic Committee of Virginia. comuníquese con el Comité Hispano de Virginia, helping everyone participate more fully in American society. ayudando a todos a participar plenamente en la sociedad norteamericana. Did you notice if you were missing half your kidney function? According to the National Kidney Foundation, 20 million people have chronic kidney disease and 20 million more may be at risk and not even know it. Anyone with high blood pressure, diabetes, or family history of chronic kidney disease is at risk. Early diagnosis is vitally important. 
To get the whole story, talk to your doctor and visit the National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org or call for a free brochure. Because when it comes to chronic kidney disease, you might not know the half. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And we have uh, nonprofits as well as for-profits that are working in the area to absorb these two billion youth folks that are going to come to the planet by 2050 to provide them the job skills so that they are actively engaged in the community and also gain the new skills, the knowledge, and the ideas that's needed as we move to a new green economy. And I have someone sitting right beside me. Her name is uh, Celia Sterling. She is the Workforce Development and Site Manager. This is a long title there, <laughs> Celia. Uh, the uh, Green Pre-Apprenticeship uh, Construction Program of the Spanish Catholic Center of the Catholic Charities of Washington, <laughs> D.C. Boy, name doesn't run out, does it? <laughs> anyway, Celia, <laughs> glad to have you with us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so you for being here. And I know that you're doing excellent work because we've known about the Catholic Charities for a long, long time. So tell us a little bit about the Spanish uh, Center of the Catholic Charities in Washington, D.C. Well, we, uh, we've we been serving the community for 45 years now. That's a long uh, time, yes, 45 years. in all the area of Mount Pleasant and West Washington. Uh, we serve the underserved, the low-income uh, community. Uh, we provide uh, integrated service where we have uh, medical service, dental, employment, and the construction program. I tell you, I think it's incredible because you're really looking at people in a very holistic manner Correct. and getting them involved, you know, as far as the dental, the health, and I know you even do nutrition, nutrition classes, classes and uh, basic education, reading, writing, mathematics, and all that. So why? what's the driving force behind Catholic Charities that's looking at such a comprehensive view of the human being that comes into your centers? It's it being able to provide hope and help. Hope but, and uh, help. help, okay, it's, it's, it's both. Uh, and then we see the clients, uh, the customer, as, as a whole. They, they need the whole, all the services in order for them to, to move up, in order to get used to the American um, culture. Uh, so in the program that we've been running for 12 years now, uh, the basis of math and reading and all the uh, certifications and safety training, all, all is geared for them to improve, to get better, to have a better job, and to be able to take care of their families. Well, I know the, the unique thing about you is that in uh, uh, non-traditional job trainings, you're actually one of the leaders yes, in the community yeah. because you have many women that come in learning construction trades, Correct. and then you have a mix as far as you know other different trades. Uh, why are the, the females uh, comfortable and they come in and become very actively engaged in these non-traditional jobs? Well, because uh, we have a set up a small training group and uh, we provide and we uh, mo motivate the, the women to participate in construction. Construction is not only for men. Mm -hmm. It's for everyone that interested to learn, to learn this skill that can be transferred to any other area. So we have uh, some of the participants, the architects, engineers, we have people who just want to be decorator, who want to take care of the houses. So the motivation is there, the location. Uh, most of us, the staff, we are women. So we're very active on, on promoting uh, and, you know, making them feel comfortable 
and, and learning about the, uh, the construction industry. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Now tell us a little bit about this Green Pre-Apprenticeship Construction Program. Very long name, <laughs> and, but I know that it's, it's very involved. And when people finish, I think that they have like a special certificate or something they yes. can receive. So tell us, how do you get into it? What is it? And then the outcomes of that. Okay. Uh, this is a 12-week program, very intensive, where the student come five days a week. Um, we have two sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and we have four different instructors certified or national industry certification. Uh, so they get... Uh, so they're really getting top yes. notch and, and very excellent instruction when yes. they come in then. And then we work with Habitat for Humanity here in D.C. where they bring, we bring the student every week uh, for them to learn everything that they, they practice in in classroom, they're able to, to help out in Habitat for Humanity with those volunteer hours that at the end of the job, these houses are for the low-income families. So we emphasize the math, we emphasize the English as a second language, they work on safety, we do OSHA, we do uh, CPR, and then we spend a lot of time on electricity, um, solar panel installation, that's where we, how we're getting into the green. Uh, they do weatherization, they also uh, work uh, um, many hours on what is green building techniques. So when they come out of this program, they really have the, the 12 weeks. My understanding is they go all day and so they really yes. have a lot of hands-on. Yes. Uh, work experience as well as they have the instruction and then the certification Correct. by these uh, nationally recognized instructors. Correct. So uh, when you're reaching out to those instructors, what do you look for besides being nationally certified? Are there other traits that you like the instructors to have so that they actually meet the needs of these students? Well, one of the main uh, qualification that we ask for the, the, to be bilingual. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been so lucky having uh, val even volunteer instructors who speak not only English, Spanish, or even French. Because lately we have not only Latino, but we're getting uh, African population that only speak French. Yeah, of course, the so, Haitians too. Yeah, Haitians. So French. for right. us to be able to, uh, on their own language, be able to teach the, uh, the, the skill mm -hmm. is very important for us. Now looking at the uh, practical transference of this, uh, many people when they're here, as you were talking about earlier, they're transient, they, you know, they're here, you know, six months, 12 months, 18, 24, they may be going other places. Uh, what can they take with them to show that they've actually been through your program, they did well, they have this practical hands-on experience, what can they demonstrate to someone in Des Moines or Chicago or, uh -huh. or in, uh, San Antonio, other places well, around the, the United States? the good thing that this is national certification. Uh, this is the NCCER, this is the National Center for Research and Construction, and so they can, it's movable, it's transferable to any other state. Uh, as part of the program also, we spend a lot of hours on job readiness. We prepare them for job interview, filling out application, doing it online, and also be able to um, prepare a, a resume that, that they can show up what they have learned. Oh, so uh, you're doing everything for them. So when they walk out of there, it's almost like they're freshly minted yes. and they're ready. They have their resume. Now, what about tools and hard hats and uh, you know, special boots, how do they gain these things? Some of these things are quite expensive. expensive. So what does the Catholic uh, Charity Centers do to make sure that, you know, the very next day they graduate, they can go right onto the job site and, and be ready to go to work? Well, one other thing that we do is that the student doesn't have to buy anything in order to be in the program. We have the tools, we have the hard hat. Uh, so while they're in the program, even to go to Habitat, they don't need to purchase anything because usually they're low income or they have part-time job or they're unemployed. So by the end, when it's time for them to get a job, usually the companies, the construction company will provide, will provide the tools 
I Usually see. they don't have to buy them ahead of time. So as long as you can take care of them, give them the, the practical skills and the understanding, also the math, the reading, yes, yes. Uh, looking at how to uh, read a blueprint, right. then the, most of the employers then are willing to provide whatever basic yes, tools they that they need uh, for that. That's, that's absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the uh, practical job skills, I know that you're really doing this comprehensively, so you're doing other things things besides the solar insulation, the weatherization, understand like electricity, masonry. What are some of these different job skills that they will gain over their time that they're with you? Well, mainly uh, our concentration is for them to be at an entry level job mm -hmm. or be able to go into apprenticeship. Awesome. So we have a so, a so few that's why I call this pre-apprenticeship pre -apprenticeship because we prepare them mm -hmm. to be able to go to any union, any trade union, and apply for apprenticeship. Um, we successfully have a few of the graduate that right now are in the apprenticeship program. And one of the things that they, they take from us is be able to pass all the requirement, uh, math tests, all the requirement, uh, Sometimes they have a GED or high school. I mean, we get them ready just as a first step to go into mm -hmm. the, any apprenticeship. So you're doing the, the language, English the language. is a second language. Correct. Of course, you're instructing in uh, either uh, Spanish or French, possibly other languages. And at the same time then that they are able to have their certificates go on. And we have this photograph here of them uh, listening to, I guess, is to go forth and do good into the world. So what are some of the things that you're trying to make sure that they have when they leave you and they're getting ready for their graduation? Well, in the past we have asked employer tell us what we need in order for them to be the perfect candidate. Uh, one of the main things that they say is good attitude. Mm -hmm. they, they want to hear that they, they graduate, want to work, that they like to work, that they can follow instruction, that they're responsible, they can get on time to the job That's site. That's really key, a key so, is to show up so on show time. So show up on time. So right. apart from all the certification, they, they need to have a good job attitude. Well, uh, looking at that, it seems like that you're really doing that. Looking at what do you see as far as the growth of uh, new green jobs and new green economy, say over the next 5, 10, 15 years for Catholic Charities, and how, what do you see for the expansion of Catholic Charities itself? And we well, only have about 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 left. seconds. Well, we hope uh, this is something that uh, calling green is too general, uh, but hopefully Washington is one of the main uh, cities where we have a lot of development going on and they are green. So we hope that by doing this program and working with DCSUE, we can uh, provide more job opportunity for our community. Yeah, I know this uh, District of Columbia Sustainable Energy Utility is very important to you and you're working closely with them and uh, Ted Trevu, I think is uh, very keen the work that you're doing. And thank you for uh, oh, being with us. Thank you so much. This is uh, Celia Sterling, Workforce Development and Site Manager. I mean, she has to go to work everybody, <laughs> every day like everybody else. Green Pre-Apprenticeship Construction Program, Spanish Catholic Center. And thank you for being with us as we look at the workforce development as we create the Emerald Planet. I helped turn my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with a curriculum that really motivates kids. One that has extended hours, six days a week, year-round. With loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged. Where teachers have more time to teach. And students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. You can help turn your school into a community school for excellence. Find out how. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. 
It's your social security statement of your benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much social security you're eligible to receive and when you'll get it. Then you'll know how much you need to save for retirement, because that's coming too. The future is in your hands. Choose to save. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie, dinner. So, who has the drug problem now? Find out how meth affects you at drugfree.org slash... back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of uh, Emerald Planet, Director and Host of Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis looking around the globe in 144 different nations looking for the thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are going to take us through the 21st century. And as we look at a planet that will soon have uh, 9 billion souls by 2050, we need to be able to prepare to take care of all the food, the fuel, the fiber, everything that's needed for the day-to-day -day experience. And at the same time, to provide the jobs and the knowledge and education that's needed. I have sitting beside me Arnell Morgan Bean, who is the Career Transition Specialist in the Construction Trades Education for the Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia Job Corps. And Arnell, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to have you out with us. Tell us a little bit about what is the uh, Northern Virginia uh, Job uh, Corps? Absolutely. Uh, the D.C. Northern Virginia Career Transition Services Office is the component of Job Corps that offers career transition services to individuals who have graduated from the Job Corps program. Okay, looking at these uh, career uh, transition services, I know they uh, come through the, the Job Corps itself. That's Tell right. us a little bit about that. How do they you know, initially get into the Job Corps? Absolutely. What are they doing? You can make this a long explanation. <laughs> and then we'll talk about the transition just in a little bit. Okay, absolutely. Well, first, Job Corps is a federally funded training and education program for individuals between the ages of 16 and 24 years of age. So the first pro pro part of the process is that they will have an outreach and admissions component. Um, the program lasts up to 21 months. Uh, prior to separating from the program or graduating, they are put in touch with our Career Transition Services Office. Our office assists the graduates with either uh, obtaining employment, enlisting in the military or furthering their education with other educational institutions. My goodness, it's very comprehensive uh, service that you're providing. So they're coming in, of course, we're focusing really on workforce development as far as, you know, construction, weatherization, uh, solar panel installation, you know, these types of things. So over these, you said 21 months, yes. so over these 21 months, what kinds of things are they learning? Uh, you know, as far as the actual skill training itself, but also aptitude, attitude, these types of things that really lead towards long-term success in, you know, the day-to-day -day work. Well, the beautiful thing about the Job Corps training program is that our students have an opportunity to have hands-on experience as well as work-based learning experiences. Mm -hmm. One of the other great things is that our instructors have real-world experience. Um, so they will, of course, complete the basic uh, aptitude, math, reading, things of that nature. Then they will actually go into their trade, um, which in this case is construction. And it depends on what aspect of construction it could be plumbing, HVAC, carpentry, um, elect 
electrical, all of those fall under the construction component. So it just depends on which area of training. I know there's about 15 different area specialties mm -hmm. that uh, people can learn, you know, masonry and yes. carpentry and all these, these other uh, skills and are very important to society. And even though we're moving, uh, you know, more and more towards, you know, the new green economy, mm -hmm. all of these skills are very much needed, particularly in electricity and plumbing mm -hmm. and heating, ventilation and air conditioning, the HVAC that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, what types of hands-on skills? Are they getting this only in the classroom? Are they actually going out to job sites to to actually enhance and develop their skills. How does this work over these 21 months? They are getting it. This in, is before the transition. Yes, this is before the transition. They are getting it in the classroom. Um, they are also, as I um, mentioned earlier, work-based work learning. One of the other great things about um, moving with the Green Initiative, a lot of the centers have implemented programs where the the students actually will install maybe solar panels or pellet boilers, different things actually I on see. the center as well. Mm -hmm. So they have different uh, areas where they're able to utilize this training and execute it. So the uh, the educational centers that you have for Job Corps actually is a uh, laboratory for learning and practical skills development uh, in its own right, not only you know for other businesses, but for the center itself. The center itself and staff as as well are trained in green practices hmm. as well. That is absolutely, uh, I know that the, this green initiative is something, it actually is an act of Congress, that the United States Congress with, you know, in concert with the president, mm -hmm. uh, really wanted to move this forward. Why the green initiative? What, what do you, what's happening within Job Corps itself that it wants to go more in the, the green direction as far as the environment, climate change, and all these other major issues? Well, uh, through funds provided by the American American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Job Corps has taken on the Green Initiative just to uh, encourage a cleaner, more energy efficient future for America. And uh, so the classes that they're uh, taking, they're actually learning how to do these kinds of things. How do you see not only uh, them leaving you and then going into a job, which is very important, mm -hmm. what do you think that they're actually learning through the Job Corps that they can actually take back home on a day-to-day -day basis? So they've been there not the 21 months, but only two months. Mm -hmm. But what kind of practical things are they learning that they can actually transfer mm -hmm. to improve their own home? Home, their own neighborhood and the city within which they live. Yes, absolutely. Uh, water usage, um, recycling, uh, alternative materials as well, um, use of alternative materials. Um, so they're learning different things that they can actually transfer to their everyday living. Um, lights, you know, making sure that you're not keeping lights on and things of that nature. Okay, so very practical things very that practical, they can do yes. uh, within the area. Now looking at the uh, the math, the reading, uh, and um, you know, looking at uh, plans so they learn how to read blueprints and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. How much time is actually spent in you know these uh, areas uh, versus you know the actual skills where they're learning you know how to do carpentry or masonry mm -hmm. or plumbing or something like that? Okay, well. Um, initially with the basic competencies um, that generally is a few months about five to six months um, and a lot of it is at the pace of the student as well um, so that may that will dedicate time will be dedicated to that um, and so they're moving really at their own pace then, so it's not like you know it's a group of 20 or whatever right. number you have and they all move lockstep through they actually are moving at you know, their pace in the math and the language art skills and right. even language and things like that. Exactly. And then they'll go into their actual trade and training, um, which there's a certain amount of time dedicated to that. And I can't give you exact amounts of time because like I said, it is self-paced, mm -hmm. but it is within that 21 month window. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll go on into their work-based learning, which typically is about a three to six month uh, time frame for their work-based learning where they'll actually go to an employer site and actually do the uh, 
work that they have learned. Oh, I see. Now, is that part of the transition or is the transition after they go through the 21 months of uh, training and education? That is uh, before the transition. So after, once they have completed uh, their basic competencies, the in-class learning and also the work-based learning, then they will transition, they'll graduate and then transition out. And that's when our, our office comes into play. Oh, I see, okay. So all right, they've gone through the basic competencies, mm -hmm. they've gotten their math and their English, their language art skills to a certain level. They test out, I would assume, through all of that. And then they've, they've done the skill training, they've actually done some on-site work. So then what is this transition and how long does that actually take? Okay, so once they've done their training, they will have acquired a GED or high school diploma and a certificate uh, in whichever trade in they have skill to, in area. their skill mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And then they will transition out to our office um, and there are many career transition services offices throughout the nation. But as it relates to the D.C. and Northern Virginia area, our office will assist them with uh, job readiness skills, just kind of reiterating what they've learned in Job Corps, um, interviewing skills, job placement. We also provide other supportive services where there may be need for housing, um, transportation, and different things of that nature, child care. Thanks yeah, I know one of the things too is just, you know, this uh, notion of dress for success. Many people, you know, kind of make light of that, but you know, dressing for success and uh, being ready to go in for a job interview, have the confidence to share your education, the skills that you've gained over, you know, this in essence uh, two years worth of time is very important. So how do you work with them so that you know, they, they go out and they have the actual confidence mm -hmm. that they've demonstrated they can do it, but how they can convey this to a future employer, I really can do this. Well, um, one of the things that we have done is uh, implemented uh, workshops where we'll actually have employers come out and speak with our graduates and actually communicate to them what it is that they are looking for. Um, and once they have that, a lot of times they hear it from us and it's like, okay, you know, we hear it from you, but to hear it from an employer that may potentially hire you, it's a little different. And then we've also uh, partnered with uh, different community partners that help us to provide the clothing that they need to dress for success. Okay, fantastic. Wow. Now, when they go out on the uh, the job and, and, you know, they've had their interview and people are interested, is there any monitoring? Do you go around to the job sites and, you know, over a few months or a few days, few weeks, you know, to make sure they're doing okay, they're showing up on time, they're staying, you know, for the full day's work and, mm -hmm. you know, they're communicating properly. How does all of that get uh, massaged so that they, they fit in nicely and they're developing a long-term relationship so they stay there and they're not just hopping job to job. Right, one of the things about Job Corps is that we are all about partnerships. So when we place our students, because we are very instrumental in placing them in jobs, uh, we also like to develop relationships with employers. So with that, we do follow up not only with the student, but also with the employer, just to ensure that the student is meeting their needs because they do have hiring needs and uh, requirements as well. Mm -hmm. So we wanna make sure that the, the student is showing up to work on time, uh, dressing appropriately, you know, taking the schedule breaks, everything like that. And well, I, think, I think it's fantastic. Well, I think we've just uh, run out of time, but it's just really uh, wonderful, Arnell, what it is that you're doing, and uh, you've done a very nice job in sharing this with uh, everybody that's uh, watching this here and abroad. So this is Arnell Morgan Bean. She is a career transition specialist. It's a very good title, actually. <laughs> Construction trades uh, and uh, working with the Job Corps in Washington, D.C. Thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet.